Thank you, Professor. So my name is Javon Taylor. Um, I'm from Lewisburg, North Carolina, which is about an hour north of here. Uh, I came to NC State in fall of 96 and graduated in 2000. So last year is my 20th anniversary uh, of enrolling and attending NC State. So after I attended State, I went on to Stanford in Palo Alto, California, where I got a, a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering with a concentration in Vehicle Performance and Robotics of Dynamic Systems. After that, I went to work for Mission Tire Corporation. Coming out of graduate school, I really wanted to work for an automotive company. Uh, the economy was, was challenging during that time. It was right after 9-11. And so uh, the economy had tanked a bit. And so I applied to different automotive companies and it, it eventually ended up in Michelin, which turned out to be a good thing because had I gone to BMW or Ford or GM, I only would have worked with BMW, Ford, or GM. So by going to Michelin Tire, then I worked with all types of cars. I remember working on a 2003 Bugatti. I didn't know what a Bugatti was until I went to France and actually saw one. Or worked with Maserati or, or Formula One just a, a large variety of vehicles. And my concentration was not only uh, with passenger car and light truck, but also with uh, heavy truck, tractor trailer. And so we're looking at the tire component to roll over. I don't know if any of you have ever seen what they call the X1 truck tire. So an 18 wheeler has how many wheels? 18, that's what they call an 18 wheeler. So you have two tires per side of axle. Well, Michelin came up with what they call the X1, so you have one tire per axle size. So an 18-wheeler becomes a 10-wheel vehicle because you don't have two, or actually four, per axle. And so what that does is it gives you a wider base and a lower stance. And if you are wider and lower, like a running back, it's harder to tackle or roll over. So part of the job that I had was looking at the tire component to roll over, for 18 wheel vehicles, so using the X1 tire. Uh, so I did that for a number of years, and then I made a shift. Uh, I really enjoyed what I was doing. Had a wonderful time in Michelin. I thought I wanted to give back in a different way, so I actually resigned from Michelin Tire and went to New York City to, uh, to seminary to train to be a priest. And I did that for three years, graduated, went to Dallas, and now I'm back in Raleigh. I've been back in Raleigh for five years. My parents still live in Lewisburg, so it's good to be back home. So this is how I describe my life. From second wave to second wave. So what do you see? Y'all laugh so you saw something. <laughs> what is it? It's a segue. Alright, who's on the segue? I look a little different. I'm in the road. You see anything kind of unusual about this segue? The tires. What's wrong with the tires? Spoke. It's something they call the twill. Anybody ever heard of a twill? You have. It's an airless, maybe you have to, it's an airless tire. So we call the tire pneumatic because it has air, pneuma, air. But this is a, an airless tire. And so I was part of this, this initial group that was looking at ways to enhance handling. And so there are advantages to this uh, non-pneumatic or airless tire uh, because uh, if you're traveling, not sure it would be, but if you happen to roll over a landmine, you don't have to worry about blowing your tire because this can withstand it. The handling is much better because it's solid. Uh, so this is how I, I mesh my two worlds. I spent 10 years, 11 years in engineering, uh, and I've been a priest for, for about eight years. So this is the collision of both science uh, in religion as I see it. So from segue to segue. I've already talked a little bit about what I did with Michelin, so this slide uh, so a little bit of a rehash. But not only when I looked at tractor, semi-trailer uh, vehicles for the impact of rollover, but also driver fatigue. So I have a question for you. If I'm sure you've seen probably these UPS trucks that run tandem. There's a tractor, 28-foot trailer, and another 28 foot trailer. And if you're like me, I don't drive beside trucks. And I don't recommend that you do either. You either speed up and go ahead or you fall back. 
But sometimes when trucks are driving tandem, the last trailer will begin to whip a little bit, right? So how can the driver stop the last trailer from whipping or shaking? What can the driver do? Accelerate, brake. What do you think will happen if you accelerate or brake? Let's go with accelerate. If you accelerate, what do you think will happen? It gets worse. All right. If you brake, what will happen? It gets worse. So what can the driver do to stop the shape? Steer. Okay, well, what are you going to do with the steer, steering wheel? Alternate, fast or slow? Slow. Why slow? Why would fast to make it work? Because it's basically vibrating in more. You can sway back and forth. And once you stop doing that, it will continue. <laughs> It's actually the opposite of that. So you increase because you take the, the vibration of the tractor, and as that moves through the different trailers, it actually dampens it out. So if you're ever pulling your boat, if you have a boat or pulling a lawnmower or something on your truck and it happens to shake, so get a steering wheel, a quicker shake, and it'll dampen it out. So we're going to talk about the tire impact. To be able to foam. So what is a tire? Most people think a tire is just round and black. So a tire is round and black. But there are so many components to a tire. A tire is a very complex piece of equipment, and it is a piece of equipment. It is something that goes neglected on cars. Um, I don't know how many of you ever check your tire pressure regularly. I know now, yes he does, but I know now cars have what they call tire pressure monitoring systems, <coughs> TPMS. Now does anybody know why the government requires that new cars have tire pressure monitoring systems. Something happened when I was young, but y'all may not have been born yet. Ford Explorer. What happened with Ford Explorer? Rolling over. Our competitor. Yeah. I'm with the company. Anybody remember the name of the tire company? Firestone. So, Ford and Firestone work together on the Explorer. When a vehicle is tall and narrow, is it more or less likely to roll over? More, right. So, Ford had this problem with ride height. So the Explorer was, was too high. And so when you did a maneuver, the truck may roll over. And so what they did to try to correct that is they deflated the tire to try to pull down the ride height. Does it sound like a smart thing to do? Not a smart thing to do. Um, and so that caused rollovers, which is why now, um, the National Tire Safety Administration uh, uh, requires that cars have tire pressure monitoring systems. But most people neglect their tires. They're much more concerned with how their car looks, uh, whether it's clean, the sound system in it, uh, even the engine. But if you don't take care of your tires, you don't keep take care of your car. Because I argue that the tire is the most important part of the vehicle. Why is that? Yep. Because it's the next to the road. That's it. It is the only thing that is connected to the ground. I mean, you can have a huge engine. Yesterday I saw an Oldsmobile uh, 442. So I'm a car guy, old car guy. I hadn't seen a car like that in years. Beautiful engine. Tires were messed up. So if this guy tries to race, it's not going to go well. But a perfect example, concentrate on the car, but not the tire. The tire is the only thing that's in contact with the road. So I have. A, a, a tire cutout, which we, we call the one on the top left the Omega Cut. Why do we call it the Omega Cut? It looks like the Greek letter Omega, right? An Omega Cut, which is a cross uh, section of the tire. And we have a peel away, so you see different components of the tire. You, of course, have the tread, which most people concentrate on because that's what you see. You have the side walls, you have uh, the metal that makes the steel belts, you have um, the plies, the nylon belts, so many components in a tire. So when you look at it, there are more than 200 different raw materials that, uh, that go into making a tire. And that tends to surprise people because they just think it's black rubber in a mold and out comes a tire. But some people are surprised to see that there's Kevlar 
in tires, or cotton, or silk. Um, and you have the different parts, as I've said, the tread, the sidewall, the shoulder, rim protector. Why do we need rim protector? What is rim protector? It does, it does help seat it and keep the seal, but what does the rim protector do? We just dissected that word in reverse. It protects the rim. So I don't know if y'all are driving downtown Raleigh, but Raleigh's one of the few cities I've seen where the curve has uh, this stone material that is square. So most uh, curves in downtown are rounded a bit. So it's not a straight edge, kind of like this wall, but rounded a bit. Why would, it, why would it need to be rounded a bit? So it won't hit the rim. So if you look at the rims of my car, they're really messed up. Uh, because you know I'm not used to driving downtown with something that is squared off. Rim protector helps protect the rim. So even if it is squared off, there is a little bit a rubber that extends outside of the sidewall. So if I go back a little bit, uh, it extends. Actually, you can see the rim protector here. This actually comes out a little bit before it goes back. So you seat the tire back here on the, on the rim, and then the rim protector protects your rim. Because instead of running your rim against the, the sidewalk, you run the rim protector. All right, so we talked about the contact patch. The average contact patch it's about the size of your hand, which is actually quite remarkable that, that this huge, heavy vehicle is connected to the ground only by something that's this size. It's not that big, four point <coughs> contact. So this is a Michelin ad that talks about variable contact patch. surface area of, of the tire to change or be the same during handling. Same, same. same, right, because the less surface area you have, uh, the worse your cars are going to perform. So this technology talks about designing the tire in a specific manner that even when there is low transfer, the contact patch, the area remains mostly the same. The contact patch area remains mostly the same. Because your professor told me that uh, you, you looked at some vehicle handling and performance uh, at a lecture, maybe the previous lecture to this one. Um, and so when you look at the surface area of the contact patch, the more that is in contact with the road, the better the vehicle handles. So now force and moment data. So the question is, if the tire uh, is more than brown and black, that is more than you pour rubber in the mold and out pops a tire, how do these components impact tire performance? So we have force and moment data. This is a tire. Uh, you can see you have your three axes. It is rolling in this direction, so outside of the screen. The normal load uh, is the force exerted upward. You have the aligning torque, the torque that causes the tire to align, longitudinal force. Why is longitudinal force important? What does it help you do? Grip the road, which means you can drive. You can accelerate and you can stop. If you didn't have any longitudinal force, you could not accelerate, you could not stop, you could not stop. If you did not have lateral force, what would you not be able to do? Corner and steer. All right. So that's the simple tire model. So then the question becomes, how do we get data that we can use in predicting tire performance? Well, there is a machine called a flat track machine that's basically 
our conveyor belt with sandpaper, and you take a tire through different um, perturbations. So you can see it puts the load on the tire, it steers, it cambers, it steers, it may brake, it will accelerate. Once you put the tire on a flat track machine like this, you get all of this data. So the problem, once you get the data, is that is raw data alone enough? What do you have to do with data? Analyze it. Analyze it. Uh, it does help to predict, but you have to analyze it. So there is something called the magic tire model. And I'll get to that in a little bit. But I use some terms in the flat track machine. What is very important with tire performance uh, is something called the slip angle. Now the slip angle is the angle formed by the tire, which is the difference between the direction of travel and the direction the tire is pointing. So if we look at what's on the screen ahead of us, the tire is traveling a path uh, with this part. And you can see my mouse you can see that it's traveling this part, but yet the tire is pointing uh, more inward, more into the curve. And so the slip angle is the difference between the direction of the tire and the way that the tire is moving. And we measure the slip angle via the contact patch. So to the left of the image of the tire, we have a contact patch. Um, as you can see that as we move throughout the distance, so the length of the tire, the length of the contact patch, that the tire bends and snaps. You can think of it like a rubber band. That at the point nearest the tire contacting the road, uh, that the rubber is going to pretty much be uh, on center. But as we move throughout the length of the contact patch, there's going to be more slippage. And then once you get out of the contact patch, the rubber or the tread snaps back. Slip angle is very important because the slip angle is really the basis of how we measure what's going on with the tire uh, and also how we predict performance. Are there any questions or thoughts? So the magic tire model. I mentioned that we take the tire, we put it on a flat track machine, we measure different forces and moments, so we take it at different speeds, at different loads, different slip angles, different camber angles. Sometimes we both do slip angle and camber because we know that when you are cornering in a car, what does the car do? If you're cornering in a car, what does the car do? It rolls. Now, there's nothing more frustrating to me when I look at a movie and there's this car scene and somebody turns the steering wheel to the right or to the left, and the person in the car, the actors, roll or lean to the left. Is that right? Because you go opposite. I mean, right? If, if, I mean, you, you, you studied uh, centrifugal and some centripetal force. As you're navigating a curve, if you turn to the left, which is me to the left, so if you turn this way, then you want one to actually go to the right. Uh, so, when we look at measuring not only uh, slip angle but camber, it is mimicking the car uh, in transient conditions because the car will roll. So the magic tire model um, takes the data, it assigns these different coefficients. Um, you can see uh, from the sign in R10, and in ours, this force of moment data that occurs when the slip angle is a certain angle K. So from this magic tire model, we take the data, the magic tire model, and then we get actual tire data. So this is from a vehicle. Typically, slip angle is on the X axis. And this goes out to 8 degrees. Some plots go out to 16 degrees. Why don't you think a plot would go out, let's say, the 90 degrees? What's that? The same race car. And if your slip angle is 90 degrees, then that means your tire is perpendicular to the area of travel. And you just broke a tie bar. And so your car is not going to work. 
So slip angles pretty much, pretty much between 8, 12 degrees negative plus and minus. So we have slip angle on the x-axis and then on the y-axis we have lateral force measured in newtons. And then on this plot we have three different loads. So not only do we have the lateral force, but we also have the normal load because the tire performs differently given the load. So we have uh, four kilonewtons, six kilonewton, and eight kilonewton of load. So what do you notice about some trends with this plot? Greater than load, greater than lateral force. Greater than load, greater lateral force. Then the maximum force the desired is output. Right. There is a maximum force that the tire can output uh, before it stops, meaning it can't grip anymore. <clears throat> And we see that, that's when the, 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 uh, the slope becomes zero and then turns negative or turns down, a downward slope. And we see in this graph, uh, that's the line right here, the line of, of peak performance, that once you reach that, that point on the graph, you're not going to generate any more force, and your car is basically sliding. So we talked about slip angles, we talked about uh, force of moment data. Another key term when we look at tire performance is the cornering stiffness. Now the cornering stiffness uh, describes the mathematical relationship between the tire's lateral force, so the force that the tire produces in the side or lateral direction, as a function of slip angle. So if we look at this graph, the cornering stiffness it's technically defined at zero slip angle. Even though at zero slip angle, there is no lateral force. It is the slope in the linear region defined at zero slip. Uh, so cornering stiffness, which carries the symbol C alpha, because alpha traditionally is the slip angle. Um, as I said, it's the linear region of the plot. So C, cornering stiffness, um, is force over A. And that should actually say nothing. <coughs> cornering stiffness and cornering coefficient. So I mentioned in this graph we have lateral force as a function of slip angle. We also have the different loads. So we can plot uh, the cornering coefficient, which is cornering stiffness, as a function of the other load. So you take the cornering stiffness and divide it by the normal load, Fz, and that gives you the cornering coefficient. Cornering stiffness coefficient. All right, so heavy truck tires. What we have, actual tire data, cornering stiffness, y-axis, uh, and then the normal load, on the x-axis and several different types, all tested on the dry condition. What I didn't mention is on the flat track machine, not only do you have the ability to test uh, dry conditions, but also wet conditions. Uh, but you can't test snow. If you want to test on snow conditions, you have to go like to New Zealand or Canada somewhere. Here axle, drive axle load. What observation do you make or can you make? <coughs> from this plot. Which actually has the highest load. The steer axle has about a thousand, ten thousand more newtons or ten uh, kilonewtons more than uh, the drive axle. A plot like this is important because it can help you determine what your understeer coefficient is. I think you've learned about understeer. Maybe. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So when we look at uh, lateral force versus uh, load, or actually according stiffness versus load, it plots, which means that as the car or the tire is rolling on the flat track, as we're moving the tire to different slip angles as we are applying the load, a plot like this gives you a quick reference for the cornering 
four fish. <coughs> so now just some practical things about tires. Tires have markings on them, and sometimes people don't know how to read the tire. So if you know how to read it, that's great. I'm just going to walk through what the letters are on the tire. So this is a 20545R16, 83B. So the first is the section width, so the tread width in millimeters. The second is the aspect ratio, which is the difference uh, between the side wall and width. So that's the percentage. Uh, and then R is radio tire uh, construction. 16 gives the wheel radius, or actually wheel diameter. Um, and then the load index means how much load the tire can bear, and V is the speed rate. Anybody know the highest speed rate? I heard Y. Y plus. W. Y. Z. In the alphabet. Highest speed rating is Z. Why is tire speed rating important? So what will happen as a tire revolves? around the wheel. So it yes, it, it heats up, it stretches, it stretches out. What else does a tire have? Uh, it starts with H. I'll do a little challenge. We think about it mostly with music. I heard it. Yeah, harmonics. harmonics. So what's, what would be the harmonic of a tire? If you had to describe that to somebody. So I say your tire has this harmonic. What does that mean? Natural frequency of the road input. That's right. So, so the frequency of the tire. So the, the, the faster the tire spins, the hotter it gets, the more that it moves from the center. Um, and then you have the different vibrations in the tire. And I don't have a video, but when we take a tire, rotate it at a speed higher than its speed rating, you see all of these, uh, they almost look like sine waves that occur around the rim or edge, perimeter of the tire. And eventually, uh, the tire will explode. Now, you have to be going really fast for it to get through all the, the steel belts and the plies, but it is possible to explode. Even before it does explode, it makes the ride very difficult. So that's why speed rating is important. If you're driving a Porsche, then you want a Z-speed rating. So of course, you can go 180 or more. If you're driving a Dodge minivan, you don't really need a Z-rated tire. So the, the, the rating, speed rating is important, and also the load index. Why would the load index be important? Yes. For how heavy your load is. That's right, depending on how heavy. So when we think about passenger cars, it really doesn't come into play. However, if you have a, a light truck, uh, a dually of some sort, and you're loading, you certainly want to know your load rating because you may put something in your truck or haul something that is too heavy. It causes your tire to deflect, and that also is not good for performance or handling. So not only do we have what describes the tire as far as the size, but also where the tire was made. A couple of years back, uh, there was some controversy that uh, some tire companies were selling old tires, uh, maybe some tires 10 years old. And so the way you read this is it has uh, Department of Transportation certification, uh, where, it was, where the plant was, the size code, the manufacturing code, but the number to always keep in mind is the last number, because that gives the year, the year and two spots. So the month and the year. Okay. So I have another plot of lateral force versus slip angle of three different tires. What do you observe about these tires? Are they the same? So what are some differences? Okay, one has a high lateral force but a low slip angle. This is uh, this is that tire. High cornering stiffness because of the slope. 
How do you think this tie in will perform? It's saying that at about three degrees of slip, it reaches its max lateral force, and then from there, 14 degrees of slip, it trails. How is this tire going to perform on the road? Was that? It'd be good in straight line. Yeah, yeah, it'd be fine in a straight line. What do you do if you start a corner? It'll be what? It'll be done. It'll be done. Right. That as you begin the corner, it's going to be like you're on ice. You may as well be ice skating because you will just keep sliding. I um, mean, eventually you will stop because friction will take over. But it's not going to perform well at all. You, you're going to lose steering. Uh, it's not going to feel good when you drive. Um, even if you apply something like three degrees, um, 3.3 G's of lateral force, which is not that much, 0.3 G's of lateral force, uh, this tire is not going to handle. So you're going to have to drive slowly uh, and very carefully. So what do you notice about the other two quads? <coughs> Where does the second one reach its peak lateral force? The second from the top, I guess from the bottom. About eight, yep. Eight, nine, ten. That car is going to perform a lot better because you can predict. One of the things, uh, particularly if you've ever raced, is that you always want to be able to predict how the vehicle will do in a certain situation. The top tire. <laughs> It's not going to be able to predict how it's going to act. One, it's a very stiff tire. It's going to move quickly up the plot as you move through the slip angle. So you will assume that it will keep that slip angle um, and lateral force relationship for maybe seven or eight degrees of slip. But you only get past two and it falls off. So the, the second one, and then the, the first one from the bottom, second one from the bottom, have better uh, predictability. However, the bottom one uh, gives you really not as much lateral force as a function of a slip angle. So very three different tires. What you will find uh, when we look at these tires is they have different tread components. They have uh, different D seating. So what's what we call seating the tire. Once you put the tire on the rim and put air in it, it has to seat. Um, that bead is thicker on one, thinner on another. Uh, also, uh, one has Kevlar, one has nylon, one has cotton. So all these different components work together to give us this data. Got a question. Oh, sorry. Yes. Of the pre previous slide, the tire, the blue line. Wouldn't that tire initially feel like a performance tire to someone who's not used to taking corners really fast? Like a read your re responsive tire. It will initially feel like a stiff tire. So we talk about uh, vehicle handling. Uh, there is handling and then comfort. So people say they want a comfortable ride. Most consumers, when they go to buy a car, they say they want a car with good handling. They want a comfortable car. They want a car that rides well. That's what most of the data <coughs> says. And so you can't have a lot of comfort and good handling. A car that has good handling is going to have a hard ride. One, the cornering stiffness of the tire is going to be harder or, or, or it's going to have a higher cornering stiffness. Also, uh, the sprung mass, the unsprung mass, the suspension is going to be stiffer. So it's not going to have a comfortable ride. So as the professor said, uh, the top plot, initially, Someone driving it will think that, wow, I have a, a car or a set of tires that handle very well in this linear region. But once you move outside of that linear region, then it's going to drop off so quickly that it's no longer going to handle well. It's going to be very, as I said, unpredictable. Yes? Uh, which type of tire would be less predictable? <laughs> Man, after my own heart. I have to have this. My, my near, my second to last slide is about this, but we want to answer the questions. So, what do you think? First, do people know what drifting is? Okay, I'll just, just a quick. So, drifting is a motor sport where you basically try to ice skate on the asphalt. You want to keep your car at some angle, maybe 45 degrees, sliding and skating um, in autocross. 
as a way, and some, some cars drift together. Have you ever seen the Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift? Perfect example of drifting. So, the, the, the purpose of drifting, or the idea of drifting, is that you really want a tire that gets you to a certain state quickly, and then becomes very loose. Because once the, the, the tire becomes very loose, you need to use your steering wheel to correct. So, I ask you, since you asked this question, what tire do you think would be better than this? Probably the blue one. Okay. That's why, why do you say that? Uh, it's the quickest uh, <coughs> peaking. It does the quickest peaking. Anybody else have a different opinion? Yes. Would you maybe put the blue ones on the rear tires and the green ones on the front tires? Okay, so now we're talking about different, different fitness. That's very good. What we call split fitness. So you said, put which one? Blue on the rear. Blue on the rear. Blue on the rear. Green in the front. And green in the front. Okay, so we talked about understeer and oversteer. Uh, Y'all, I guess you look through my slides, so it's actually getting a little bit ahead. We're going to tackle it right here in a moment since we're dealing with it now. Uh, when we talk about understeer, it is the axle load divided by the cornering stick. The axle load divided by the cornering stick. Yeah. All right. So here we have the normal load of the front. We divided by the corning stiffness of the front. The normal load of the rear divided by corning stiffness of the rear. And we got neutral steer, understeer, oversteer. So if you assume um, a 50-50 weight distribution, what does that mean if a car is 50-50 weight distribution? Same on the front, same on the, same on the front, same on the back. BMWs tend to be 50-50. If you assume both of those being equal, and then, I think it was gentleman over here, said that you put uh, the blue one, which has a higher right quarter stiffness on the back. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. Which means this number is going to do what? Yeah. It's going to go down. Uh, this had less, it's going to go up. Uh, so you want to have the corner stiffness of the rear being less than sorry, the court, uh, this, this will be, yes, greater than that. So it's going to be more oversteer. And that is correct. Did you text, you test me on that? Do you agree with what I said? Yeah, I think that's All right. Good idea. Because the understeer coefficient, I'm using terms I haven't really introduced, but I mean, this was taken from your professor's slide like the last lecture, so you've seen this. Um, the understeer coefficient, neutral is zero. Understeer, uh, meaning the front slope is greater than the rear, and oversteer, the rear is greater than the front. So the next slide talks about understeer and oversteer. Um, if you're in the mountains of North Carolina, and you're driving, let's say you're making a left-hand corner, if your vehicle is understeer, what do you do with the steering wheel? So if you're navigating a left turn this way, the ravine is to your right, the mountain is to your left, your vehicle is understeer, what do you want to do with the steering wheel in order to, to, to navigate that turn? <laughs> you turn it which way? Towards the road. Toward this way, right? That's right. They say an understeer vehicle, uh, when you're racing, you hit the barrier with the front end of the car and then it oversteer with the rear end of the car. So same situation in the mountains, navigating, uh, making a, a left, not turn, but navigating left. Uh, your car begins to oversteer, to slide toward the ravine to the right, which way you turn the steering wheel to, to the right. Um, which for most drivers is not an 